Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, the possibility of uh, talking today about art, science and do-it-yourself biology. Um, well, with the rise of biological engineering and in particular with the development of genetic engineering in the 70s, um, the laying of the foundation of a new economy based on biological parts began. The promise and the peril of this new economy of life was in the hands of experts based in academic institutions or cooperation organized by capital, politics and bureaucracy. Within this frame, more and more artists became interested in the debate and effects of biological technologies and left their traditional background uh, or playground, the art, um, uh, artistic studio, to work instead in biological laboratories. From um, our today's perspective, uh, we can observe all in all um, three phenomena uh, I will bring to your um, attention. And the first is art, uh, bio art, transgenic art, um, art that is developed and made in the laboratory. Science, here I decided to focus more on science communication um, and science goes public and I will show you two examples from uh, two German science centre, especially one uh, in Wolfsburg where you also can do hands-on science uh, in a wet lab. And in the end I will briefly talk about uh, do-it-yourself uh, biology, but um, the talk that will be um, after my talk will go, Denisa Kera, she will go much more into the details. So um, I will try to show a little bit how it all began that artists went into the lab. There's a long, long history that artists work with living materials. One of the first artworks was done by Kandinsky um, uh, within the movement of uh, uh, Russian um, um, avant-garde um, about 1910. And um, the Austrian artist, Peter Gavin Hoffmann, he has, um, came back to this uh, movement um, uh, in the 80s uh, when he uh, took some microbes by, a, uh, by an artwork of Kandinsky. Um, going into the lab, you see these two pictures in the middle of the presentation, and I choose this imagery to show you that in those days, the artist had to refer to an expert or someone who is um, helping uh, the artist at the wet bench. And the outcome was just, it, it's about that size, the outcome um, was just, I would say, a little bit of nothing, but uh, this was the artwork in the end. And uh, he called it Mikroben by Kandinsky and um, was collaborating with a museum in, Mu in Munich and also with an institute in Graz. So. Um, to sum up this, uh, this, this uh, example, um, the artist was uh, an amateur or wasn't really uh, educated in biology or um, training, uh, doing anything in the lab, so he referred to an expert and then showed uh, a kind of um, result uh, as an artwork to the public. The next uh, example is a couple of years later when artists um, started to work in the laboratory um, and also this is an example of Rainer Maria Matusik, a Berlin-based bioartist and he started um, to, uh, with the foundation of uh, something called Institute für Biologische Plastik and uh, he was training his students in the lab to produce their <coughs> bioart in the lab. So what happened is here that the artist tried not only to work with an expert but to become trained, not an expert, but be to become trained um, to a degree that he was able, he and his students, was able to produce the artwork in the laboratory by himself. But of course also collaborating with um, some experts in the lab. But what you see here, um, you see Rainer Maria Matusik in the middle of, the, um, of this picture. Um, he's very good in using the pipette and uh, has a kind of mastery in doing that. But also he's, he's also working with uh, a lot of other 
um, uh, media, and, uh, but it is important to keep in mind at this stage, artists started to um, try to get into the institutions where the facilities were to work um, on bioart. Um, this is another uh, example. Um, there are many, many, many examples around 2005. Um, this is an Australian artist, Peter Clancy. She also produced her artwork in the, in the lab um, uh, and then uh, produced a kind of artwork. Then she put it out in, in a, on a bigger scale and then she was showing in, it in an uh, art institution. And here I have another example by an artist and photographer, uh, Edgar Lissel, a German who is based in Vienna. And um, um, this is just one example, but sometimes he also used his own face. It was all about, um, the whole project was all about producing a kind of portrait to find an adequate mode of representation uh, at the end uh, of the 20th century, the beginning of the biotech era. And so he went into the lab uh, with the help of some uh, technicians, produced his own artwork with his body. So this, are, this were, you know, it's just an example. There are many, many other artists who did that as well. And then we also had, uh, of course, artists going in the lab like Susan Anker. She can't be with us today, but she was uh, part of our workshop. And she also um, used um, um, analog uh, um, media to show the production of knowledge and hands-on science uh, in the laboratory. Um, some people don't call that bio art, but still she is, um, I will show you later, uh, um, now setting up a bio art lab in her art school. And then something else happened um, already uh, in 2004, the same year like the uh, bio, uh, biotech workshop of Rainer Maria Matusik, that artists invited other artists and people who were interested in um, getting to know hands-on um, biotechnology into workshops um, um, sometimes in art institutions where they try to get uh, the facilities um, 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 together, or they went into, uh, art uh, into laboratories where people who were running these laboratories were open uh, and friendly uh, to uh, also invite artists. So this is another step. You see there's a community, a group of people. Um, it's not about, very often not about producing a piece of art or an artwork. It's much more about um, getting acquainted with the uh, tools and technology, talking also um, about the pro and cons of uh, <clears throat> the biotech uh, age. And uh, of course, you can't see that from this um, uh, photograph, but it's very much about building um, um, uh, communities and uh, teaching also each other. There is not one single expert, although uh, sometimes they hired an expert from a lab. Uh, but some of the artists were already um, so um, strongly, was uh, so familiar with the technology that they were teaching each other. Yeah, and um, what happened uh, with uh, movements like that? Of course, institutions react on that. And there's, a very there's just two examples. There are many, many more examples around the world. In, uh, but I show you one um, answer on this movement at a university and another answer of that movement at an art school. And the one is a very well-known symbiotica, where you can do, as an artist, uh, the master of biological arts since a couple of years. But the context is quite remote. Perth in Australia is very far away from the rest of the world, although it's a, it's a wonderful city and uh, the university is very, um, um, very vital and lively because a lot of people from China and Asia study in, uh, in Perth. And <clears throat> but um, they started their laboratory and their um, um, context um, together with scientists. And I think there was no art history or art theory or art school whatsoever. whatsoever. They were building um, these uh, very impressive um, 
yeah, institution uh, with scientists. Although Oren Katz and Ayan Azur, they call themselves a designer, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't take, uh, produce, or wouldn't choose any label. Uh, I think there's just interesting work what they uh, do uh, since a, a couple of years, I would say 10 years or so, a bit more than 10 years. On the other hand, we have um, the reaction of um, a very expensive, uh, well-known art school in New York, um, the School of Visual Arts. It's one of the biggest art schools in New York. And what they just uh, installed in 2011 is a bio-art lab. So here we see a shift that the artist has not to go into the laboratory of the scientist or has to um, uh, transform his own kitchen into a laboratory to produce the artwork. But uh, if you have enough uh, resources, financial resources, you can be part of the uh, summer residence uh, program and produce uh, as an artist your own artwork and get acquainted with a lot of bio artists uh, in, uh, in uh, New York. So this was uh, another answer um, to this uh, movement. And this is just, these are just two examples, one university, another one a private art school, but there are many, many other institutions around the world that started um, um, art and science collaboration practices, artistic research, master degrees, um, and bio art is always uh, part of the agenda. Yeah, and also some art historians reacted on that as well. Just to mention two, um, one is the, uh, um, the Arts and Genomics Center here at University of Leiden. And I guess the Vax uh, Society could also be um, you know, mentioned uh, in this case. Uh, but I, I choose these two examples uh, just to show that art history as a very traditional uh, discipline um, also tried to, to um, yeah, step in and try to understand what kind of movement we have with bio art. This is my own book here, uh, the dissertation I finished in 2003, and it took me a while to also to, uh, to translate it into English. And, um, but there are many, many other books out there as well, not actually by art historians, but by uh, people from the field of um, uh, other sciences. And um, of course, um, the government, especially, I will show you two examples, um, and the Science Center, uh, um, community also reacted on that development. And I show you a, two examples. Um, the first one is um, a very, very prestigious project uh, in Wolfsburg uh, where they built um, Volkswagen cars um, called uh, Feno, the Experimentierlandschaft, um, that was built uh, by Zaha Hadid, opened in 2005. And I think uh, the official number is 80 million euros. They have 9,000 square meters. And of course, they also invited artists to um, also to uh, yeah, be part in the, um, I would say, not even development, but in producing kind of interactive tools to present science. And I went there just recently to make a, a few pictures to show you today. This is just one um, view. And they also have uh, um, um, a, a one of the um, focus is now is um, not only physics and chemistry, but also the technology of biology. So they have a kind of uh, wet lab in the building. But every time I went there, and I have to say I only have been there three times, something was broke and it was closed. It was always empty like this. This is not in the morning, say 10 o'clock when they open or at night before they close. This is 12 o'clock or something, but nobody went there because something uh, with the microscope went wrong and then they closed it down. So you see, this is absolutely the opposite of um, the imagery I was showing you with a bio artist going into the labs, meeting, talking, trying to put up a community. And I think now 80 million euros is, is, is quite a lot. So I think you could expect that there is a lively institution. But this institution, to be honest, they, of course they try a lot to make workshops and things, but it's mainly for school children. 
And you see that in London, in New York, in, in Berlin, we have something like that we call Technik Museum, Deutsches Technik Museum. So we have these things um, um, all around Germany and Europe, I guess also in the States. But I guess these are very prestigious political um, yeah, statements. So, yeah, another, oh, this is another, of course, they show in the, there's an, it's not really sharp, sorry for that, but of course, they show imagery uh, produced by the microscope, and of course, you somehow you can interact with, with some uh, little machines or, uh, and then get to know a little bit more about the life sciences. So it's, it's not just watching, it's also a little bit interactive. And as another example, I want to show you another very <coughs> prestigious project by the Max Planck uh, um, Society. Next to the Helmholtz uh, um, um, Society, one of the major money giver, government money giver for science. And they just opened in 2011 a so-called so science gallery at Gendarmenmarkt. Gendarmenmarkt is where the Academy of Sciences and another other prestigious institution this is one of the most expensive parts of Berlin. And here you see, um, this is all you know, from their website. And you can see it should be very participatory and interactive. This is what they say on the website. The only thing you can do is push the button, which is, which is fine. Uh, it is very interactive, but, but it's not a community. It's not hands-on doing something what we have seen before. And I just you know, made some screenshots from their website. Um, I think um, in many uh, science centers, the pictures would look the same. And what, of course, they also do is inviting artists. Because there's always a little bit of money left for art and science collaboration. I don't actually know what this is, but this is what they had on their website about art and science. There is a, she's an, uh, an artist. Uh, working on brain scans and, and brain activity, and this is uh, the outcome. So, and um, yeah, this is, I, I, I couldn't find how much they, um, how much this uh, was cost, uh, the, how high the costs were, but I guess uh, maybe not a couple of million, maybe not 80 millions, but I, get a, I guess a lot. And this is part of the movement that science goes public. And these are just two formats, uh, and I think there are many other formats uh, um, they developed. But what we see at the moment, or I would say for a couple of years, is a very different movement as well. And um, there are a few buzzwords like uh, do-it-yourself biology, community labs, open source biology, biopunk, uh, and biohacking. And this is... Um, quite interesting, and we will hear more from Denise Akira about that. But it's interesting because uh, this is a movement where artists, but also um, people from other fields, uh, challenge very much um, the concept of expertise. Um, people who have little training, or um, some have more training, uh, start in community labs or at home in the kitchen to work with living materials with biotech. And this was quite difficult in the last couple of years, but because the costs drop so much, that and some little companies are specialized on selling, um, I would call self-made uh, products to these communities, um, because um, uh, I would say a couple of years ago, it would co have cost millions and millions to install a laboratory to do um, fancy things. And nowadays, um, maybe not on a professional level, but whatever it means professional here, but because of the uh, drop of the costs and the, the service industry that developed around lab uh, technology, because very often these um, do-it-yourself biology uh, teams don't do the biology uh, uh, manipulation themselves, they just order it via the internet. And the dream is being a bioartist without doing biotech, just ordering things and putting them together at home, producing new kinds of tools that probably save the world or not. <laughs> and um, there's another interesting, I show you here one example, which is one of the uh, for, uh, earliest one in, in Boston, uh, Boss Lab. And another very uh, interesting uh, uh, community lab, Gene Space in New York, 
we have something like that, not in that big scale in Berlin as well, and I guess in many, many other parts of the world, um, in bigger cities. But um, yeah, and I think Denise will uh, talk a little bit more about this hacker, um, hacker terrier, and uh, I just want to show you one of the, here's the Vox Society, image of our house where we are tonight. And these bio, um, yeah, do-it-yourself bio, uh, or open source biotechnology now is a huge movement. And the interesting thing is that um, a lot of venture cap capital uh, circling around the globe is now thinking, or some people pretend this is a new like wave um, similar to the, to the situation in the 70s, 80s when non-specialists were inventing um, new tools in the computer industries. And uh, the interesting things were not made by IBM or Siemens in those days, but by people sitting in a garage or sitting at home at mom's table or something. And the same ideas or the same thing that happened in that, um, in that um, branch, uh, which is now a multi-billion industry, some people think could probably happen as well to biotechnology. So, um, a lot of people are very excited about that movement. Um, but the thing is, things uh, can be seen there. So I come to an end with two longer uh, uh, quotations. And one is Freeman Dyson, uh, uh, a physicist and um, very um, well-known um, author. And he wrote a book on biotech future. Um, no, this is a re uh, uh, a kind of book review on a book he wrote in 99, um, but he wrote something on our biotech future in 2007. And um, he believes strongly that a new economy based on biotechnology will say, solve a lot of problems, um, especially in the third world, because all these um, uh, money-making machines are in um, wealthy countries and in the cities. And his idea is bringing back, uh, with the help of biotechnology, money back into the villages in the third world um, to solve some problems. And um, yeah, I think he sees it very, very positive. Um, and he hopes that uh, domesti the domestication of biotechnology will uh, solve um, a whole range of our problems concerning energy and so on and so forth. But there's, of course, also, um, and this is my last slide I will show to you, uh, also a very negative um, attitude towards um, the domestication of biotechnology. And especially after 9-11, the American uh, government is, was started, I think there was worry before, but then they really started to be worried about a bio, uh, um, a bio attack uh, or bio weapon attack. Uh, and uh, this is uh, quite interesting and I have chosen not to frighten you, but I think it is quite interesting because there's this risk report from 2008 and they think there will be a kind of bioterrorist attack at the end of 2013, and I hope this will, of course, not happen. But the whole topic, and uh, I think Denisa will show us in a minute, is not only um, as, um, I would say, naive and friendly as we just saw artists gathering around in labs, talking to each other, sharing knowledge, uh, doing hands-on experience with the real things. Um, things can go wrong and, and, and hopefully they won't. And um, yeah, this is the end. <laughs>